Let's pray. We're going to look to God's word. I'm going to pray that God will open our hearts and our minds as we look to his word today. So let's pray one more time this morning. Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I thank you, God, for people who, even in this crisis, it has not affected their level of faith. And by that, I don't mean their giving. I mean their serving, their love, their compassion for people. In fact, if anything, it has increased their level of faith. They're witnessing more. They're praying more. They're more in your word. And God, we want to be like that woman that runs out to meet you and still believes, even when there's a crisis, even when there is a great problem, even in the face of death, yes, in the face of death and sickness, we step out in faith and believe, God, that you are able to heal and restore. And so, God, I ask once again that you would watch over every family, every individual, God, every couple, every child that is a part of our community of faith. God, I pray that you would bless them today with your protection. And now, God, as we look to your word for a few minutes, God, would you just guide us and direct us Open our hearts, God. We want to not just see the words on the page or on the screen. We want to see them by faith today. And we want to be made, uh, we want to be changed. We want to be transformed by your word. Help us with this, we pray. In Jesus' name. Okay, say it one more time. Say amen for me right there at home. And we'll get down to business. All righty. Well, uh, we're in a little two-week series. And last week, uh, we talked about seeing is believing. And Uh, Today, we're actually going to pick up on that same theme, seeing is believing. This is just part two. We learned last week, I'm not going to recap, don't worry, but we learned last week on Palm Sunday that many of the people who saw Jesus did not really see who Jesus was. They cried out uh, uh, on his entrance into the city, Hosanna, King of the Jews, King of Israel, and this is our Savior, this is our God. But a few days later, they were crying, crucify him. Although they had seen him, They didn't really see him. We talked about the power of of perception and and being able to see who Jesus really is. And uh, that's really my prayer today for this simple little message that we have on Easter, that you would see Jesus. Now, we learned last week, and so here's our first slide. Watch this. Your reason for seeking to see Jesus is very, very important. Because from that reason will come the result, either salvation or disappointment and abandonment. It's it's the truth is this is that we see with our mind. Now, I don't have time to give you that same lesson I gave last week all about the receptors in our eyes and how the human eye works. And and I spent a lot of time researching it because I just love to do those kind of things. And I don't know how anybody could be a scientist and understand or a doctor and understand how the human eye works and not believe in God. This little camera that you have is an absolute miracle. One of the things that blew me away, however, was that I learned this after I preached it last week because someone sent me an article to read was that with all of its power and all that it does, it is actually the brain that sees, not your eye. The eye is just a lens, it's just a camera. And so I I believe, and we preached it last week, that our brain can actually affect our vision. Sometimes we see what we want to see. Sometimes we don't see what we don't want to see. And we learned that last week, that that our eyes sometimes can trick us and fool us. And you've all seen those optical illusion things. No, that can't be true, but, but it is, in other words. So we are not referring today to seeing Jesus in a temporal sense, but rather in a spiritual sense. My prayer, my hope for this sermon, as I put it together, as I've prayed over it, is that we're actually trying not to open mortal eyes, not human eyes, but eyes of faith. Faith is actually the eye into the soul. And with faith, we can actually see The Bible says the unseen, the unperceived, that which is not relative to us on a temporal level. Uh, We can only see Jesus, I believe, for who he truly is through the eyes of faith. If you look at Jesus today, and I'm glad you're looking at him. Listen, I'd rather you look at Jesus than look somewhere else. And the world today is focused on Jesus. And that's that's brilliant. That's fabulous. I would much rather people look at Jesus than look at some politician. I'd much rather people look at Jesus than look at the devil. I'd much rather people look at Jesus than look to themselves or some celebrity or some TV preacher. Oh, wait a second. We're all TV preachers now. I would much rather you look at Jesus today. And so I'm thrilled on this Easter Sunday. As I said, this is a strange Easter. But, but, but here in America, uh, I, I was blessed when I saw that one of our news channels, one of our news channels, Yes, it was Fox News, for those of you that wonder, but one of our news channels today at 10 o'clock is going to be airing a a gospel message by Billy Graham, 
Uh, by Franklin Graham, Billy Graham. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? Yeah. They brought him back just for that. Talk about resurrection. Uh, uh, the, the Franklin Graham is going to be preaching a, a message of hope to America. And, and friend, I don't know about you, but if that's what comes out of this COVID-19, well, then you know what? There's some silver lining even in this dark hour. People are looking to Jesus. But I know that Franklin Graham would echo my words today is that don't see him. Don't see me. Don't just see a picture of Jesus that you have in your mind. Let's open our eyes of faith and ask God, God, would you help us today to see by faith so that we might truly see who Jesus is? We read last week of the entrance into the city of Jerusalem, and we read that there were those there who saw. Remember that word? We, we highlighted it in the reading. They saw Jesus. They saw him. They came to see him. And then we heard about some Greeks who said we would like to see Jesus. I read on in the story, and I can't believe how much this word see and saw and spectacle comes up. So we're going to take a little reading this morning uh, from Luke's Gospel and it says now, this is actually at the crucifixion. It says now the people stood watching. But even the rulers ridiculed and sneered at him, saying, He saved others from death. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and cruelly offering him sour wine to drink and sarcastically saying, if you are really the king of the Jews, save yourself from death. Now there was also an inscription above him that said, This is the king of the Jews. It was now about the sixth hour, about noontime. And the Bible says darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. So from noon until three, there was like an eclipse, pitch black, because the sun was obscured. And the veil of the Holy of Holies, we sang it in that song this morning. Uh, the veil in the Holy of Holies that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. It says the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Yeah. I believe the reason it was torn from the top and not the bottom is because it was God who tore it, not man. Yeah. We, don't, we, don't, we don't tear away into his presence. God opens a way into his presence. Hallelujah. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. Now there, now it says, when the centurion saw. Who's the centurion? He, he's the guy that's in charge of crucifying Christ. It says that when the centurion saw what had taken place, he began praising and honoring God. What? <laughs> Saying, certainly, this man was innocent, righteous. Uh, Matthew's Gospel says, when they saw the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. All the crowd who had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had happened, they began to return to their homes, beating their breasts, their chests, as a sign of mourning or repentance. It is a strange fact that at the crucifixion, the people we see accepting Jesus and seeing Jesus for who he really is. First of all, we see a thief on one side. There's a thief on the other side. And you know the story of the crucifixion. One thief mocks him and makes fun of him. The other thief says to him, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus says to him, this day thou shalt be in paradise. First man saved in the new kingdom. <laughs> A thief. And look now, all of the religious leaders are around there. Everybody is there. And this rough, rugged man of blood and war, a Roman centurion. A centurion was a soldier in charge of a hundred men. And so his platoon, his little group of men, had been the ones responsible for beating Christ, for mocking him earlier. And now this man, who has been a part of the process suddenly opens his eyes spiritually and he says, and it's my text this morning, truly this was the Son of God. He understands. He doesn't just see. He understands who Jesus was and is. And I say is because he still is truly the Son of God. Well, uh, it, it, was it what he saw in the temporal sense? Was it the horrific death? I heard someone preach once, but because Jesus suffered like no one else, uh, this is why he, 
kind of repented and, and saw Jesus. I, I think this man had seen a lot of blood and gore. He had been in battles. He had been in close combat. He had, he had seen a lot of crucifixions. I don't think this was his first day of crucifying somebody. He obviously had this job. And so as gruesome as the death was, I, I think it was more than just seeing Jesus die. I, I want to talk to you in a moment about what he saw. I believe that he heard the gospel, the good news, and he saw the gospel in Jesus. My prayer today is that in the next 10 minutes, and I literally mean 10 minutes, that you and I will hear the gospel and that you will see the gospel, that you will see it in this one called Jesus. This is my prayer. This is my aim on this Easter Sunday morning. I got two points to my message, a couple of little subtitles, but two main points. I want to talk to you this morning quickly about the result of hearing Jesus and the result of seeing Jesus. The result of hearing him and seeing him. You're going to hear my words today, but my prayer is that my words, as they enter your ear, that they will touch your brain and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God will let you see Jesus for who he truly is. Because some of you that are watching, you, you join in every Easter and, and that's good. Like I said, it's, it's better to be closer to the Lord than far away from him. But some of you watch and look time after time, but you never truly see him for who he is. That's my prayer today. Father, would you open people's eyes, would you open their ears, that they might hear and see the truth of your love and your forgiveness. By the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Two quick points, watch, jot them down. The results of hearing Jesus. I, I want to talk to you quickly about the results of hearing. We're going to look at this Roman centurion, and we're going to listen for a moment to what he hears, and we'll see how it affects him. Um, Jesus spoke seven times from the cross. Uh, there have been tons of sermons on it. There have been tons of books written about it. I'm not going to cover all seven today. We don't have time. If you're on our app later, you can look way down the bottom of our app on the app notes down below where there's a little study. We'll give you all seven of them so you can research it and read it yourself and make your own little sermon out of the other points. I want to talk to you about just three or four of them today. I, I want to talk about three or four of the things that Jesus said, that this Roman soldier was standing here listening to Jesus. And, and, and I've kind of given them titles. So if you got your pen, write them down or take a picture. Listen, number one, the voice, the message of forgiveness. It says, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Roman soldier. He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about the people that are there crucifying him. He says, Father, forgive them. And this Roman soldier hears this. It's, it's interesting to me that the first utterance of Jesus, the first voice that he speaks from the cross, is a prayer. We'll make note of it today. The first thing Jesus says is a prayer, and the last thing he says is a prayer. It's good to start your day with prayer, and it's good to end your day with prayer. It's good to start a problem with prayer, and it's good to praise him out the other side. And Jesus prays this prayer. Now, I don't know if the Roman soldier knew it or not, but I'm sure that he knew a little bit. So give me some political or po political. Give me some poetic license today to believe this. Had he heard that this Jesus had taught his disciples? Guess what? You have to love your enemies. Had he heard that we are to pray for those that despitefully use us? Had he heard someone else say, this guy teaches that you got to turn the other cheek when you're slapped? This guy teaches that you got to forgive. And he, I'm sure he must have heard from somebody that this Jesus has told people, I know in the law it says, you know, uh, uh, you can hate your enemies and love those who love you. But no, no, no. I say you must love even your enemies. What human can pray like this? What human can ask this kind of question? And we know from later revelation of God's word that John 3.16 tells us that because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The very reason that Jesus came was to bring forgiveness. This was the mission. This was the purpose. He came to die so that you and I would not have to die. He came to shed his blood so that you and I could have our sins washed away. And the first thing the Roman centurion hears is this voice of forgiveness. Wait, I can be forgiven? I'm telling you today, listen to me, if you're watching this, you can be forgiven today. Every rotten thing you've ever done, every sin you've ever committed, the big ones, the little ones, Jesus can wash away your sin today. You can be forgiven. You can have a clean slate. Woo! You can start all over again. 
One of the saddest things I hear, I, I meet with a lot of people, and not now, I'm not meeting with anybody, but when we're allowed, I'm meeting with people. And, and one of the things I hear over and over and over again is, Pastor, I just can't forgive myself. I just can't forgive myself. I, I love it when people say it to me because I, I know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> what I say to them is, no kidding, and you should stop trying. When I think about what I have done, when I think about all the things I've done, I can't forgive myself. And here's the truth. We're not supposed to forgive ourselves. So stop trying to forgive yourself and let Jesus forgive you. The reason some of you can't let Jesus forgive you is because you keep trying to forgive yourself. Stop. You don't have the power to do it. And listen to me. Forgiveness from the Lord is far more powerful than forgiveness from oneself. So even if you forgive yourself, guess what I know? Tomorrow you're going to do something bad. Tomorrow guilt will come back. You can be forgiven by Christ today and all of your sins can be forgiven. So don't try to forgive yourself. Let Jesus forgive you. The voice, the message of forgiveness. Secondly, the message of salvation. And I know some of you are saying, aren't they the same thing? Well, not really. Listen, Jesus said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I've already made reference to it. This is Jesus talking to this thief that is uh, being crucified alongside him. And and look, I I don't have any doubt in my mind that the devil was behind it, that Jesus was not crucified alone. Uh, He was being mocked. He was being made fun of, not only by the men who had crucified him, but by the demons, by, by hell itself. They were trying to mock our Savior. And so Instead of giving him the hill alone, what do they do? They surround him with common thieves and sinners to try to demote who Jesus is. But can I tell you something? I'm not shocked by it because what the devil meant for evil, God has turned into something good. This Jesus is crucified among sinners. Why? Because this is who he came for. And he was letting them know, guess what? I'm I'm here to wash away your sins. I'm here to forgive you, but I'm also here to bring salvation. The old hymn writer said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. What can cleanse for my cleansing? This I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption. That is our deliverance and salvation through his blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted, watch this, in forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin in accordance with the riches of his grace. The centurion heard the message, the voice of forgiveness, and he also heard a voice of salvation. Listen, to have your sins forgiven is is a wonderful thing, but can I tell you something? I haven't just had my sins forgiven. I have been saved. I have been restored. I have been put back. I love this old-fashioned word. We, we don't use it enough in church today. We, we, pe- preachers don't talk about it enough, but I, I love that old-fashioned word, repentance. The thief said, surely we deserve to die. We're thieves, but this man is innocent. Uh, and, and so notice, what was he doing? He was acknowledging his sin and what? That he needed salvation. He was repenting of his life. And and this word repentance has gotten such a negative connotation. Anybody watching from our home church right now knows what I'm about to say, because every time I say repentance, this comes out of my mouth. I can't help it. Repentance literally means something wonderful. It's two words put together. Re, we put the R-E in front of anything that we want to do over again. And behind it is pentance, which is the Latin word uh, for penthouse or pent, the top. We get our English word penthouse, the best apartment, that deluxe apartment in the sky. When we talk about the best apartment, we say that's the penthouse. The word repent literally means that God just wants to save you and put you back where you belong. Put you back on top, no longer living under circumstances or under conviction or under guilt, but up on top. Why? Because he has forgiven us and he has saved us. If you're forgiven today, you've also discovered salvation. The Roman centurion hears the voice of forgiveness. He hears the voice of salvation. Thirdly, I'm almost done. He hears the voice of triumph. Jesus said, he said, it is finished. Whoo, man, I love those words. And he bowed his head and the amplified adds, and it's, it's there, I like it. And he voluntarily gave up his spirit. You need to understand this Jesus who hung on the cross was God in the flesh. If he wanted to at any moment, he could have literally 
gotten down from the cross and destroyed everyone who stood around. But he chose to give his life. But in giving his life, he, he's dying, and the Roman centurion hears what? It is finished. What is finished? God's plan is finished. And you can trust God's plan. And, and we will be victorious. Demons had sought to destroy him and kill him all of his life from a child. When he was born, do you remember the, Christ, the, the, the Christmas story? Herod killed all of the children in the area that were of a certain age when, when he asked the wise men how old they were. Why did Herod do that? I believe that he was empowered by a demonic spirit to what? To try to kill Jesus when he was a baby. They had tried to kill Jesus all through his life and could not. But now he gives himself. Why? Because this is the message of triumph. It is finished. I have done the work that my Father has sent me to do. Now, I want you to notice this. Jesus didn't say he was finished. He said it was finished. Jesus isn't finished. In fact, the kingdom had only just begun at this moment. This new kingdom, this new testament. It had two brand new converts, a dying thief and a Roman centurion. There'd be a bunch of others in just a little while. But this kingdom had just been birthed. Even as he gave up the ghost, I, I've already made reference to it, but man, I got to tell you, it says the veil was torn. At this moment, the veil in the temple. And for those of you that are new to faith, let me just quickly explain. In the Old Testament temple, uh, there were three chambers. The third and final one being the Holy of Holies. In there was the mercy seat where a priest, the high priest, could go once a year and, and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and ask for the forgiveness of the people. And there was so much ritual and so much kind of religion involved in that process. And, and so now, as a sign, as a symbol, I believe God tears that veil that that high priest could only enter into once. Guess what? You and I can now come boldly, triumphantly into the very presence of God. We, all we have to do when we pray is say, Father, in Jesus' name. <laughs> now make sure it's in Jesus' name because that's the name that gets you in. The Bible says he is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. There's no way to talk to the Father except through Jesus. And so the moment we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, guess what we are? We have triumph over everything we face. This Roman centurion heard uh, the voice of Jesus. He heard uh, the voice of forgiveness, the voice of salvation, the voice of triumph. And finally, he heard the voice of reunion or the message of reunion. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice. This is Jesus' final prayer. It's his final words on the cross. And it's a prayer. I told you he began talking to his father. He ends talking to his father. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. He gives himself into his father's hands. You want to hear a great sermon on this text? Go listen to my dad preach on Good Friday morning if you haven't listened to it. Uh, when he was preaching, I thought, man, he's stealing my sermon here, but that's okay. There's plenty to talk about. Yeah. But if you want to hear a great message on committing yourself into the hands of God, uh, tune into our Good Friday message. But the Roman centurion, he didn't hear my dad preach on it, but he heard Jesus preach on it. Yeah, yeah. He said, and Jesus crying out with a loud voice. Listen, because he lives, we shall live also. Yeah, yeah. This is the voice of reunion. There were different voices. The voice of forgiveness. Jesus on the cross was forgiving mankind. There was a voice of salvation. I can bring you into my kingdom. There's a voice of triumph. We get to win. We're on the victory side. But there's also a voice of reunion. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard. Here we go again about seeing and hearing. And no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. For those who hold Him in affection and reverence, for those who obey him and who gratefully recognize the benefits that he bestows. You see, there's a lot more to seeing than just seeing. You read that verse. For those who hold him in affection and reverence, who obey him and who gratefully recognize his benefits. For those who see him as Jesus, as Savior. Guess what? There is the promise of heaven. Listen, the rougher the seas, the more difficult the journey, the more sailors long for the harbor. As our trials grow, as the days are filled with difficulty and pain, the more heaven becomes our desired haven of rest from weariness and worry. 
Now, I, I'm not an escapist, and don't, don't, don't get nervous. We're not going to make you drink Kool-Aid. We're all not leaving today. But can I tell you something? When I watch the world around us, when you watch the news, when you see what's happening right now with this pandemic, you realize, wow, the return of Jesus is much sooner than we thought it was. Jesus could come today. He could come tomorrow. The world is ready right now for Jesus to come back. My question is, is have you heard the voice of Jesus? Have you heard the voice of forgiveness, of salvation, of triumph, and of reunion? Uh, listen, the results of hearing Jesus were that some actually saw who he was for the very first time. And the Roman centurion is one of them. I believe that when I get to heaven, and I'm going to heaven, not today, but I'm going to heaven. I spoke with someone from our church yesterday on the phone, and they were talking to me about a loved one. Uh, they were talking to me about their mother-in-law, actually. A much, uh, an older woman, much, much on in years, and uh, it seems like it's, it's her home calling. She's sick and a lot of ailments, and her body is giving up. And I talked to him for a few minutes and tried to encourage him. And I was, I was waiting. I, I didn't want to ask. But uh, finally in the conversation, he said, you know, my mother-in-law, you know, she loves the Lord. I said, man, you just said the greatest thing you could ever say to me. Yeah. You mean your mother-in-law has heard the voice of triumph. She has heard the voice of forgiveness. And she has seen Jesus for who he is. He said to me, yes, pastor, absolutely. I said, man, you need to tell your wife, guess what? We're going to cry. We're going to be sad but not like everyone else because we're going to see her mom again. Yeah. I had a brother years ago die and leave this world. and I believe that because he walked with Jesus, he's walking on streets of gold today. Yeah. Yeah. And one day I'm going to see him again. This Roman centurion heard this voice of reunion. Jesus said, I'm going to go back to be with you, Father. I'm going to go back to heaven. And guess what? If you've accepted Christ in this life, when you leave this life, that's where you will go. The voice of reunion will be yours. The results of seeing Jesus. My second point, and I'm done. Listen to this. The result of seeing Jesus. All the crowds who had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had happened, they began to return to their homes, beating on their chests as a sign of mourning or repentance. They were troubled by what they saw, by the spectacle. Some, I know, were permanently affected. The Roman centurion, I believe, is in heaven. The dying thief, I believe that he is in heaven. We know that just a, a day or so later, uh, on, uh, on the Resurrection Sunday, we know that Peter preached and 5,000 people accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We know that there were many who had seen these things and were changed by what they saw. Now, can I just be a little bit sad with you for a moment? Look what it says. And because they had seen this, it says they were beating on their chests as a sign of mourning or repentance. Some mourned because of what they saw. Oh, that's sad. That's terrible. But others were turned to repentance because of what they saw. In listening to this message today, you have a choice to make. You can look at this Easter story and you can say, wow, what a tragedy. That's sad that a man would come and God would send his son and the mankind would kill him. That, that's really sad. That's a terrible thing. And you can return home. It, it says some, unfortunately, I believe, returned to life as it was. They returned, it says, to their homes. Some of us will come out of our crisis. Some of us will come out of what we're going through right now, even as a nation, and some will just return to normal. Others will be forever changed. Why? Because they've seen something that they didn't see before. And I'm not just talking about health things now. I'm talking about, I believe there have been people that have woken up to the fact that it's family and relationships that matter most. We've been locked in the house with our loved ones, without all of our toys, nowhere to go, nowhere to shop, nothing to do. And we've found out that, guess what? We can survive with just the people that we love. There will be people out the other side of this who go right back to what they used to do. They'll go right back to living the way they did, living life the way they did. And I think that will be sad. There will be many others who come out the other side of this and say, you know what, I'm going to go back to work, I'm going to go back to life. But you know what, I'm going to make sure on my day off I spend some time with my kids. I'm going to make sure I take a Sabbath. I'm going to make sure I take that vacation. I'm going to spend time. There will be people who learn lessons because they see things. That's a very temporal uh, analogy, but can I tell you this? You have a choice today in this sermon. 
You can see Jesus and see what he has done and, and you can have a sense of mourning, sadness, or you can repent. Listen, I, I got two slides left. Listen, religion is about us looking at ourselves, usually in comparison to somebody else or a, a, a list of perceived right and wrong actions and attitudes. It's about gauging or judging ourselves worthy or unworthy. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is all about looking at Jesus. It's not about looking at a bunch of rules or regulations. It's not about gauging yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as him. I'm no thief. I mean, I wouldn't have been crucified with Jesus. I'm an honest individual. Listen, we are all lost. We are all born in sin. If you don't believe that, have children. Uh, you have to teach your child how to tell the truth. You don't have to teach them how to lie. A little three-year-old will lie to you about cookies like that. They, they just will. <laughs> Kids will just lie. Why? Because we're all born in sin. And the truth is, our only hope is to look and see Jesus for who he truly is. That he is the one who can bring forgiveness. He is the one who can bring salvation. He is the one who can bring triumph into your home and your life. And he's the one who can bring the reunion that you and I need. So I close with this thought. Listen, seeing and accepting Jesus is the most important, life-changing eternity transforming seeing and accepting thing that you will ever do in this life I, I know that sounds like double dutch so let me say it again seeing and accepting jesus is the most important life changing eternity transforming seeing and accepting thing that you will ever do in this life and my prayer today is that as we close in prayer right now in a moment that as, as, as I ask you to pray with me, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will see Jesus perhaps like you've never seen him before, that he is the one who can forgive you. He is the one who can bring you into his kingdom. He is the one who can give you triumph over your past. And he is the one who can promise you a reunion in heaven that you and I can look forward to all the days of our lives. It's like I said, I, I don't want to go today, but man, the rougher life gets. There have been a couple of times in the last month I've thought, okay, Jesus, you can come now. I'm all out of bread or this or that. I, I need the bread of life. But friend, can I tell you something? You can have that assurance in your heart today if you'll see Jesus for who he truly is. Yes. Would you pray with us this morning? I'm going to ask you right there in your living room to just bow your head and close your eyes. God, I ask you right now that by your Holy Spirit, you would help people see the truth of who you are. If I've said anything, God, that would distract or detract from who you are, just erase that from their minds and let them hear this simple truth that the Roman centurion heard, that you're a God, you're a Savior who brings forgiveness. You bring triumph, you bring salvation, and you bring reunion. That heaven can be our eternal home. Friend, while you're there right now in your living room, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your personal Savior, now is the day for you to do that. And I'm going to ask you right where you are to just pray this simple prayer. Pray it out loud. Say, Father, in Jesus' name. Say it. Go ahead. Father, in Jesus' name, I accept your Son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sin, and I turn my life over to you. I accept your forgiveness, and I claim the promise of reunion. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, you're in the kingdom. You didn't join new life. You didn't join the church. You didn't switch religions. Relax. All you did was you got rid of religion and you've come into the kingdom of God. If you did it, we'd love to hear from you. In the comments down below, say, I prayed that prayer. Someone will reach out to you. We'll connect with you. We'll send you a Bible. We'll send you a beautiful gift. Uh, there's a little connections card or a link. You can click on that link and Give us your information. Check the box that says, I accepted Christ today. And we'll reach out to you in love. Tune in next Sunday. Just keep getting fed the Word of God. When you get a Bible, if you have a Bible at home, read the Gospel of John. If you've never read a Bible before, get a Bible. You can go online. You can get them for nothing. Just read online. Read the Gospel of John. You'll reaffirm and you'll rehear some of the things that I've been talking to you about today. I pray that this is the best Easter you've ever had, the greatest Easter. I pray God just brings peace and hope into your family. And uh, we miss you, New Life. I can't wait to get together and see you all in person. But until then, or perhaps until Jesus calls us home, uh, we'll keep coming to you on live stream and uh, we'll keep bringing the message of hope. 
God love you. God bless you. Happy Easter from New Life.